Hey, it's Professor Grabowski. And in this video lecture, I'm going to be talking about covering talks, specifically how journalists should go about covering things like speeches, discussions, and meetings. And it's important to know because covering a talk or a speech is a typical assignment for journalists. Uh, and that might include things like covering an individual speech, for example, a commencement speech given by someone, uh, or a speech given at uh, some sort of uh, event on campus. It might include uh, a lecture. It might include some sort of forum or discussion. Uh, it could be a board meeting, something like the school council meeting, for example, or the, um, the, uh, the school board meeting. It might be a press conference, or, or it could be a debate. Uh, once you get the hang of it, it's not too tricky. But many young journalists initially struggle with these types of stories. And the reason is that too often they fail to explain to readers why the event matters or what was newsworthy about it. Instead of focusing on who said what, they focus on dull details. For example, many college newspaper articles have begun with a topical lead like this. On February 17th, General Norman Johnson addressed students at Adelphi University. The event was held in the Performing Arts Center at 3 p.m. It was sponsored by the Student Affairs Office. Now, approaches like that are boring because they don't explain to the reader why they should care about the story. Remember, you want to avoid topical leads when you're writing news stories. So don't just tell us that there was a speech or that someone spoke because that doesn't really entice us into wanting to read on and to know more about uh, what happened. I mean, instead, you're kind of begging the reader to read on. You're saying, well, this happened, you know, there was a speech, maybe something interesting was said, maybe something interesting wasn't said, read on and find out. Chances are that readers will not read on uh, and that they'll jump ship immediately. So you really wanna uh, hook your reader in at the beginning by either uh, having a good summary lead, you know, um, if the speaker raised a provocative pointer, for example, you might focus on that in the lead, or you might sort of tease uh, the reader in with a, with a good uh, um, creative lead. So let me show you what I mean. So in that previous example I gave you about the general speaking on campus, uh, a better approach would be something along the lines of this. Let's say that the general came to campus and he talked about uh, the issue of having transgendered soldiers serve in the military, right? That's kind of been a controversial issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, President Obama had one policy, President Trump switched it. Uh, so it's an ongoing sort of issue. Uh, so let's imagine that this, this hypothetical general who I made up uh, gave a speech on that topic or that that issue came up when he was giving his speech. So if that was the case, you might write a summary lead like this. Transgender soldiers should be allowed to serve in the military, a high-ranking U.S. Army leader said Monday. And now we have a quote. A soldier's gender has nothing to do with their ability to serve and protect the nation, General Norman Johnson, Undersecretary of the U.S. Army, told an audience of approximately 300 students and faculty at Adelphi University. So note the differences between this lead and the previous one. In this lead, uh, we kind of focused on who said what, rather than just you know having a topical lead like there was a speech. We left out some of the kind of the dull, boring details that can wait till later, you know, like the fact that 300 people attended this and that it was you know at uh, Adelphi University, uh, and instead we focused on what was said. We also use a delayed identification lead, uh, and by that I mean you delay identifying um, the the person involved in in the news story you know unless it's someone really prominent someone well known um typically readers uh aren't going to know who this person is who you're talking about so by including their name in the lead that sort of just bogs down the lead with an unnecessary detail that you can include later so a better approach than a topical lead is to begin with a summary lead where you focus on the who and the what uh and in this case it is you know um transgender soldiers serving in the military um, should be allowed, and that was said by who? Uh, this high-ranking U.S. Army leader. Uh, let me give you another example. So every semester, uh, I have the class go and cover a live speech, and last semester, uh, I had a, um, 
successful young alumnus come to campus uh, to give a talk. So he's working in journalism and he spoke about his career and offered students advice for how they can offer into the field. So um, the students had to cover that and write up a story. Um, a topical lead, which would not be a good way to begin the story, might go something like this. A young alumnus spoke at Adelphi University Thursday. A recent graduate talked to students Thursday. So these leads are topical because they just say, well, someone spoke, but they don't really say why the person spoke, what they spoke about, or why we should care. So the reader really doesn't have any incentive to read on. It's, it's a topical lead. It's basically just saying there was a speech, and that's just not an interesting way to begin a story. Uh, instead, you could begin with a summary approach, something like a young award-winning journalist returned to his alma mater, Adelphi University on Thursday, to offer career advice to students who are trying to break into the media. So this lead summarizes the who and the what. You know, the young alumnus came to campus to give a speech on breaking into journalism. Um, and note, it also uses a delayed identification lead because even though this journalist is somewhat successful, he's not like, he's still young in his career. He's not like a super famous journalist, so most people aren't gonna recognize his name, so you can use a delayed identification lead. Um, for this story, you could have also used like a creative lead approach. Uh, which some students did when they covered it. So for example, uh, you could begin with a creative lead approach known as a list lead, where you kind of list uh, a series of things. Um, for example, do internships, network, and apply everywhere. These were tips offered Thursday by an Adelphi University alumnus who's now working as a journalist to current students looking to break into the field. It's not easy, and you will encounter a lot of failure, cautioned Vincent Masana, who graduated from Adelphi with a communications degree in 2013 and now run, runs his own award-winning journalism startup. Masana spoke to students in Professor Mark Grabowski's news writing class. Only six years ago, Masana was sitting in the same class, blah, 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 blah. You get the idea. Just remember when you begin with a creative lead, after that, immediately after that creative lead, you need to have a, a nut graph which kind of summarizes the who, what, when, where. Uh, now, in terms of organizing your story, what comes after the lead? Um, you don't have to worry about the chronology of the speech. If the most interesting thing the speaker says comes at the end of the speech, you can make that your lead. Likewise, if the most boring stuff comes at the start of the speech, you can put that at the bit, bottom of your story or leave it out entirely. Rarely is chronological order the best or most interesting way to organize a speech story. So avoid covering the speech like you're a stenographer. Uh, you do, however, want to make sure you get direct quotes. So direct quotes are the exact words that a speaker uses, and they go in between quotation marks. So every speech story should have quotes from a speaker. It's really weird to read a, a story about a speech where everything's paraphrased, where you don't have any direct quotes. You wanna have some direct quotes in there so we can kind of get a feel for uh, the speaker's language and uh, the things they talked about. Remember, um, when you're quoting someone, you want to quote the exact words of the speaker. Uh, you don't wanna make up any things or um, sort of add your own language because then it's not a direct quote. And you shouldn't just quote them on anything. Right? You want to focus on the most interesting quotes uh, to use in your story. So what is a good quote? Well, a good quote should grab the reader's attention, it should evoke images in the reader's mind, and it should convey a sense of the speaker's personality. So for example, let me give you an example here of two different quotes. And think about for a second, which one of these two would be a better quote to include in the story? So broadly speaking, a good quote is when someone says something interesting and says it in an interesting way. So with that in mind, look at the following two examples uh, from that aforementioned hypothetical general speech. Which of these two quotes is better? Number one, we will use US military force in an appropriate and decisive manner. Number two, when I take action, 
I'm not going to fire a $2 million missile at a $10 empty tent and hit a camel in the butt. It's going to be decisive. Right? So obviously you'd want to use the, the second chord because the language is a lot more colorful, sort of gives you a glimpse into this general sort of uh, manner of speaking and his personality. Okay, um, so that's kind of an overview of covering speeches. Here's some more advice um, along with you know, a suggested way for organizing your story. So first, you want to research the topic of your speech and the speaker. Um, you know, ask for, ask the organizers, whoever's organizing speed event, the speech, speech event for the speaker's bio, or you can go and Google that person on the web ahead of time, get background information about the topic, look up articles previously written on it, and see if you can either get a copy of the speech ahead of time, or at least talk to the speaker in advance to get a feel for what the speech will cover. Um, you know, a lot of times, when someone's giving a big speech, they'll, they'll, they'll write it up ahead of time. And if you ask nicely and agree not to publish it before they give the speech, you can get a copy of that transcript. So this way you can go and write your speech story ahead of time. I mean, you still need to go to the speech and cover it to make sure the speaker said what they were gonna say and that you know something crazy didn't happen during a speech. But um, you know, if that's not possible, maybe you can at least talk to them in advance get an idea for what they plan to talk about so this way you can write a skeleton outline ahead of time and then fill, fill in the details during a speech, you know, get actual quotes when you're covering the speech. Of course, it's possible you might learn about the speech so close to the deadline that, that it's not possible. But, you know, um, as much as possible, you kind of want to do your homework in advance. So if you learn that someone's going to be giving a speech and you're going to have to cover it, at a minimum, you at least want to kind of Google the person, take a look at their LinkedIn, see if they have a bio on their companies or organizations website and get some background information about them. Maybe see if they've talked about this topic before and what they've said. Um, second thing you want to do is arrive to the speech early and get a good seat. Uh, and the reason is that the place where the speech is occurring might fill. So you don't want to be late and um, not be able to get a seat, or you don't want to be late and have to sit all the way in the back and then it's hard to hear, or you don't want to come late and you miss the beginning part of the speech, right? Because that's when the most interesting part of the speech might, might happen. Um, so there's also some situations where um, you might not be able to get in after the speech starts. I know a lot of times at the White House, for example, um, if you want to cover something at the White House, first you have to get your name put on a list um, so that they can check you ahead of time, make sure you're clear. Um, and then when the actual event's happening, you need to arrive in advance because once the, the event's underway or the speech, um, a lot of times they won't let reporters uh, come in late. Um, the third thing you want to do is make sure you bring the right materials when you're covering a speech. So a notebook, for example, a pen, uh, a recorder, uh, perhaps a camera or a video camera. You know, if you have a smartphone, that can take care of a lot of those things. Uh, I know like on the iPhone, for example, they have um, an app which lets you uh, <clears throat> do voice recordings. And of course, you can also take uh, fairly high quality images um, with, with your uh, camera phone. Um, but the thing is, um, keep in mind that sometimes technology fails, right? That your battery dies or you're recording and you forgot to clear out all those photos you have on your phone so you don't have enough of uh, storage space to record the entire speech so your phone stops recording. Um, so that's why while it's good to record uh, speeches so that you can make sure that you quote the person accurately, you do want to also take notes. Um, so take notes as if the recorder doesn't exist, um, but like I said, it's good to have that recorder as a backup, so this way if the person's talking too quickly, uh, you don't miss what they said, and you can also make sure that you transcribed what they said accurately. I mean, that's especially important if a bunch of people, other reporters are covering the same speech. If your quote is different, 
than what everyone else has, people are going to wonder why. And uh, even if your quote is only slightly different, right? If you capture sort of the general sort of point of what the speaker was trying to say, if you don't misrepresent it, it's still not totally accurate. And that's going to sort of call into question your accuracy. You know, uh, readers are going to wonder, well, what else might not be totally accurate in, in your story? So it's good to have a recorder so that this way your quotes are, are consistent with what was actually said and with what other uh, reporters have. But, you know, you don't want to just record it because it will take forever to try to transcribe your um, the transcript of the speech when you get back to the newsroom and you might not have enough time to do that. You might have to file your story pretty quickly after. So it's good to, to keep notes and on the time to note occasionally have you know note what the, the time was so 10 minutes in put a note 10 minutes 20 minutes so this way you could go back on the recorder and see where different parts of the speech took place so you can look them up to make sure you got uh, your, your quotes uh, accurate um, when you're writing your story you want to include uh, the crowd size how many people attended the speech uh, and if it's a big audience, if it's a small audience, you know, less than 50 people, like if you're just in a classroom, then you should just hand count. You should just go around with, you know, and count the number of people there. But if it's a fairly big crowd, uh, you know, if you're big in a big auditorium or arena or something, you're going to have to estimate. Um, so um, you don't have to have an exact number, but there is a big difference between an audience of 50 people and an audience of 500 people. Um, so, you know, you can ask organizers for a head count, but if their number seems way off, you may want to mention that. Uh, you might also want to compare it against what your own estimate is. Uh, also, try to describe the general makeup of the audience. You know, for example, are the people in attendance college students? Are they senior citizens? Are they business people? Uh, et cetera. Um, when you're writing your story, don't make the mistake of summarizing the entire speech because most speeches are boring and they really only deliver one message. So don't try to cover every point the speaker makes. Instead, focus on the most important stuff. That's what the reader wants to know. If the reader wanted to hear the entire speech, they probably would have attended the speech or watched it on TV. Um, listen for the takeaway moment. Many speeches have a pivotal moment that defines them. Maybe the speaker says something controversial, or maybe the speaker suggests an unusual plan of action. If the audience has a strong reaction to something said, chances are that's the takeaway moment. Uh, the takeaway moment is what you should lead with and go into more detail about it later in your story. Speeches are generally planned events, but it's the unexpected turn of events that can make them really interesting. Um, after the speech, stay after if possible and get some audience reaction. Um, you know, unless you need to like jet off to file your story really quickly in order to meet a tight deadline or you have to go and cover another event, uh, stick around after the speech and uh, interview a few audience members to get their reaction. This can sometimes be the most interesting part of your story. You know, if there's a reception, go to it and talk to the people there. Try to pull the speaker aside and ask follow-up questions or clarify points the speaker made if possible. This way you can ensure you understood what the speaker was saying. Uh, don't be, temp temp don't be uh, afraid uh, to ask tough questions. When possible, you also wanna balance your story. So uh, people, especially politicians, will often make speeches in areas or places they're comfortable with, where they know they'll be surrounded by their supporters. So the audience's reaction might be very partisan. So try to talk to other people affected by the speech who may not be in attendance. So for example, um, if you're at an alumni reception for your college and covering a talk the president is giving to alumni, and she mentions that the college is gonna have to raise tuition, um, well, there might not be a whole lot of reaction from the audience because it's alumni, right? They're probably going to be like, whoa, geez, I'm glad I graduated. Now I don't have to pay for this 5% hike in tuition. Um, but they might not be all that angry about it because it doesn't affect them. 
On the other hand, it will affect current students, right, who may not be in attendance because it's an alumni event. Um, so you might act, you might want to reach out to students and say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, I just covered this alumni event where the president announced she's going to have to raise tuition. What's your reaction to that, to tuition going up? Um, also, when you're covering a speech, make sure you focus on the news. Uh, you know, it's not your job to sort of be a PR or public relations mouthpiece for the speaker or to make them look good. Um, so corporations, politicians, sports teams, and celebrities often try to use speeches, especially press conferences, as public relations tools. In other words, they want reporters to put the most positive spin possible on what's being said. But keep in mind, it's the reporter's job to ignore the PR talk and to get to the truth of the matter. So if the CEO announces that his company has just suffered its worst losses ever, but in the next breath says he thinks the future is bright, well, forget about the future being bright. The real news is the huge losses, not the, the PR sugarcoating. Um, don't be intimidated, you know, whether you're covering a speech with a celebrity, a famous athlete, uh, president, the governor, etc. Don't let yourself be intimidated by their power or stature. That's what they want. You know, once you're intimidated, you'll stop asking tough questions. You'll be timid. Uh, so remember, it's your job to ask the tough questions of the most powerful people in our society. Right? That's kind of one of the mantras of journalism is to sort of question authority. Um, in terms of writing the story, reporters have two jobs. Um, to pass along the speaker's message and to also help readers examine that message. Keep in mind that what's newsworthy may not be what the speaker thinks should be reported or what the speaker thinks should be the focus of your story. Or what's newsworthy may not be what was said during the speech, but what was not said, right? So if a politician, for example, uh, let's say is under investigation for some sort of scandal and they give a talk, but they don't at all reference that scandal, well, that's kind of like the 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? Like everyone knows it's on this person's mind, but they're trying to pretend it's not. So that could actually be part of the story. Um, the news could also be how the crowd reacted to what was said. You know, what's newsworthy may not even factor into the speech at all. The news may come after the speech when the speaker is answering questions. So, so just keep in mind, you know, pay attention. Keep in mind that when you're covering a story, sometimes the speech itself might not even be the story. Um, you know, if after the speech, when there's the Q&A, session sometimes you know they'll let people in the audience ask questions if someone asks a question and the answer provides the most interesting piece of news lead with that um, don't include everything said in the speech just the important parts uh, take good notes so you can use direct quotes in your story make sure all the names and titles are correct right it's really easy to sort of bungle people's names and misspell them uh, when you're writing stories, so you need to double check to make sure it's spelled accurately and consistently in your story. And after a speech, you want to write the story as soon as possible. Um, because even if you, let's say you have a relaxed deadline, let's say you're writing for a weekly newspaper, so your story isn't due until a few more days, um, you still want to sit down and write the story right away while it's fresh in your mind. Because otherwise, if you wait to go back to it a few days later, um, you might have trouble kind of making sense of your notes, um, you know, and the speech also just won't be fresh in your mind. So you'll have to figure out again, well, what was the most important person that said? What, what were the highlights? And, and that can just be inefficient, you know, a waste of time. So writing the story uh, as soon as possible enables you to get the information down more accurately. Uh, in terms of structuring your story, uh, I talked about, you know, how you should begin your story, right? That you will want to avoid a topical lead. Um, let's talk about the rest of the story. So like I said, first you have your lead and that is the most newsworthy point the speaker made. If the speaker is not a well-known or important person, it's probably best to use a delayed identification lead. And remember to have a nut graph if you begin with a creative lead. 
Now after the lead, second paragraph, uh, it's good to get the speaker's voice in there. So try to have a powerful quote from the speech to reinforce the lead. The third paragraph, you can start to get into sort of the boring details like where, when, and why the speech was given. And then the rest of the story should combine quotes, descriptions, background information, and audience reactions. So that's typically kind of a, a good formula for how to structure uh, your speech. Um, but of course, sometimes rules are meant to be broken and, and you might need to take a different approach. Um, so I've talked about things you should do when covering a speech. Let's talk about things you should avoid. You want to avoid using the words addressed or spoke to or spoke on or spoke about in the lead. You also want to avoid backing into the lead. So for example, in that example I gave you about the recent alum who came to speak to campus, you wouldn't want to have a lead that goes something like this. In an address to an Adelphi University journalism class Thursday, Vincent Masana, blah, blah, blah. Um, also avoid telling your readers what the speaker thinks or feels or believes instead of what he or she said. I mean, the reality is we don't know what the speaker truly believes or thinks, right? I mean, especially with politicians, they're not always honest, right? They just say what they think will help them get elected. So you don't wanna say that someone believes this because we don't know what a tr person truly believes. All we know is what they said. So use um, the verb said, not verbs like feels or thinks or believes. Um, also avoid trying to add liveliness to your story by characterizing what the speaker said or how strongly he or she felt it instead of telling us what they said. So for example, in that speech I gave you about the recent alum speaking on campus, you wouldn't want to say something like, Masana stressed the potential difficulties graduates faced in finding a job, all right? Um, because when you characterize the way things were said, um, there's a possibility that your bias uh, kind of might might enter the story. So that's covering a speech in a nutshell. Um, if you want an example of this in action, I've posted here uh, a story um, on a, um, a speech given by a NASA official, and you can see it kind of follows that that formula that we discussed. I realize looking at this on the screen might be a bit difficult to to really kind of process this and analyze it. So if you want to take a look at it yourself, um, there is a link that you can plug in to your browser uh, to to look up uh, this speech on the screen I just showed you. Just make sure that you post it in exactly. So the lowercase letters need to be lowercase. The uppercase letters need to be uppercase. Otherwise, the link won't work. Um, and finally, if you want some practice covering speeches, uh, what you can do is find a speech that was recorded and posted online on YouTube or something like that. And that was also covered by the media. Um, so for example, during this coronavirus um, pandemic, the president's been giving press conferences every day and journalists will go and write about it. Uh, you know, you could go and cover one of those press conferences he gives just from your living room, write up a speech and compare how you covered it to how it's covered by like the Associated Press or something like that. Um, or you could go and look at uh, TED Talks, right? There's a lot of TED Talks posted on TED.com and on YouTube.com. And some of them have received media coverage. So for example, uh, Bill Gates in 2015 gave a TED Talk called The Next Outbreak, We're Not Ready. Uh, so that's been getting a lot of press coverage lately, right? Because we're in the middle of this coronavirus situation. Um, but what you can do is go and watch that speech uh, like I said, it's posted on YouTube. It's also on the TED Talk site, and it's entitled The Next Outbreak, We're Not Ready. Or you could just Google something like Bill Gates 2015 TED Talk. So you can watch a speech there. It's not very long. I think it's eight and a half minutes. Uh, and then you can go and write up a short story about it, you know, a few hundred words, maybe 500 words. Um, and you can compare your story to how it was covered by other journalists when they covered it live. So uh, if you go to Google, you wanna go to the, the news link and do a Google news search for uh, Bill Gates' TED Talk. 
and then you want to restrict your search to the year 2015. Um, so this way you just get the stories from people who, who covered it at the time. Um, because now it kind of has an entirely different context. So it's not sort of the same as someone covering the speech live. It's more like people writing about it like, oh, Bill Gates told us so. Um, but anyway, if you go and look at how it was covered at the time by the journalists when Bill Gates gave the story, uh, you can see there's a, a few different media outlets, BBC News, Fortune, uh, The Drum, which covered the speech and summarized it. So you can see how your coverage of it compares to the professional's uh, coverage of it. Okay, well, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, hope this was helpful and uh, thanks for watching.